Section 12 of The Carved Lions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Bodorf. The Carved Lions by Mary Louisa Molesworth. Chapter 12 Good News. I don't suppose there was anything really infectious about my illness though nowadays whenever there is any sort of sore throat people are very much on their guard perhaps they were not so cautious long ago however that may have been myra was not banished from my room for very long i rather think indeed that she used to creep in and sit like a little mouse behind the curtains before i was well enough to notice her but everything for a time seemed dreamy to me the first event I can quite clearly recall was my being allowed to sit up for an hour or two, or, more correctly speaking, to lie up, for I was lifted onto the couch and tucked in almost as if I were still in bed. That was a very happy afternoon. It was happy for several reasons, for that morning had brought me the first letter I had had from dear Mamma since she had known of my bold step in running away from school. Lying still and silent for so many hours as I had done, things had grown to look differently to me i began to see where and how i had been wrong and to think that if i had been more open about my troubles more courageous that is to say if i had gone to miss ledbury and told her everything that was on my mind i need not have been so terribly unhappy or caused trouble and distress to others a little of this mamma pointed out to me in her letter which was however so very kind and loving so full of sorrow that i had been so unhappy that I felt more grateful than I knew how to express. Afterwards, when we talked it all over, years afterwards even, for we often talked of that time after I was grown up and married and had children of my own, Mama said to me that she could not blame me, though she knew I had not done right, for she felt so broken-hearted at the thought of what I had suffered. It had been a mistake, no doubt, to send me to Green Bank, but mistakes are often overruled for good. I am glad to have had the experience of it, as I think it made me more sympathizing with others, and it made me determine never to send any child of mine, or any child I had the care of, to a school where there was so little feeling of home, so little affection and gentleness, above all, that dreadful old world rule of letters being read, and the want of trust and confidence in the pupils, which showed in so many ways. A few days after I received Mamma's letter, I was allowed to write to her. It was slow and tiring work, for I was only able to write a few lines at a time, and that in pencil. But it was delightful to be free to say just what I wanted to say, without the terrible feeling of Miss Aspinwall, or worse still, Miss Broom, judging and criticizing every line. I thanked Mamma with my whole heart for not being angry with me, and to show her how truly I meant what I said. I promised her that when I was well again and able to go back to school I would try my very, very best to get on more happily. But I gave a deep sigh as I wrote this, and Myra, who was sitting beside me, looked up anxiously and asked what was the matter. Oh, Myra, I said, it is just that I can't bear to think of going back to school. I'd rather never get well if only I could stay here till Mama comes home. Dear little Geraldine, said Myra. She often called me little, though she was scarcely any taller than I. Dear little Geraldine, you mustn't say that. I don't think it's right. And you know, when you are quite well again, things won't seem so bad to you. I remember once when I was ill. I was quite a little girl then. Myra spoke as if she now was a very big girl indeed. I think it was when I had had the measles. The least thing vexed me dreadfully. I cried because somebody had given me a present of a set of wooden tea things in a box, and the tea ran out of the cups when I filled them. Fancy crying for that. I know, I said. I felt like that, too. But this is a real trouble, Myra. A real, very bad, dreadful trouble. Though I've promised Mama to try to be good. Do you think, Myra, that when I'm back at school, your Grandmama will sometimes ask me to come to see you? I'm sure, my little friend began eagerly. But she was interrupted. For curiously enough, just at that moment, Mrs. Cranston opened the door and came in. She came to see me every day. And though at first I was just a tiny bit afraid of her, she seemed to me such a very old lady, I soon got to love her dearly, and to talk to her quite as readily as to kind Miss Finmore. What is my little girl sure about, she said, 
and how is my other little girl today not too tired and she glanced at my letter you have not been writing too much dearie i hope no thank you i replied i'm not tired she's only rather unhappy granny said myra i think that's a very big only said mrs cranston can't you tell me my dear what you are unhappy about i glanced at myra as if asking her to speak for me she understood granny she said poor little geraldine is unhappy to think of going away and going back to school mrs cranston looked at me very kindly poor dear she said you have not had much pleasure with us for you have been ill all the time i don't mind i said i was telling myra only she thought it was naughty that i'd rather be ill always if i was with kind people than than be at school where nobody cares for me well well my dear the troubles we dread are often those that don't come to pass try to keep your spirits and get quite well and strong so that you may be able to enjoy yourself a little before both you and myra leave us oh is myra going away i said i thought she was going to live here always and somehow i felt as if i did not mind quite so much to think of going away myself in that case oh no said the old lady myra has her own home where she must spend part of her time the grandfather and i hope to have her here a good deal too it is easy to manage now miss fenmore is with her always in my heart i thought myra a most fortunate child two homes were really hers and i i had none this thought made me sigh again i don't know if myra guessed what i was thinking of but she came close up to me and put her arms round my neck and kissed me geraldine she whispered by way of giving me something pleasant to think of perhaps as soon as you are able to walk about a little i want you to come downstairs with me to see the lions yes i said in the same tone but you did give them my message myra of course i did and they sent you back their love and they are very glad you're better and they want you very much indeed to come to see them myra and i understood each other quite well about the lions you see i went on getting well steadily after that and not many days later i went downstairs with myra to the big show-room to see the lions it gave me such a curious feeling to remember the last time i had been there that rainy evening when i crept in as nearly broken-hearted and in despair as a little girl could be and as i stroked the lions and looked up in their dark mysterious faces i could not get rid of the idea that they knew all about it that somehow or other they had helped and protected me and when i tried to express this to myra she seemed to think the same after this there was not many days on which we did not come downstairs to visit our strange playfellows and not a few interesting games or actings as myra called them did we invent in which the lions took their part we were only allowed to be in the show-rooms at certain hours of the day when there was not likely to be any customers there dear old mrs cranston was as particular as she possibly could be not to let me do anything or to be seen in any way which mamma could possibly have disliked and before long i began to join a little in myra's lessons with miss finmore lessons which our teacher's kind and understanding ways made delightful so that life was really very happy for me at this time except of course for the longing for mamma and father and hattie which still came over me in fits as it were every now and then and except a still bigger except for the dreaded thought of the return to school which must be coming nearer day by day myra and i never spoke of it i tried to forget about it and she seemed to enter into my feeling without saying anything i had had a letter from mamma in answer to the one i wrote to her just after my illness in it she said she was pleased with all i said and my promise to try to get on better at green bank but in the meantime she wrote what we want you to do is get quite strong and well so put all troubling thoughts out of your head and be happy with your kind friends that letter had come a month ago and the last mail had only brought me a tiny little note enclosed in a letter from mamma to mrs cranston with the promise of a longer one next time and next time was about due for the mail came every fortnight every afternoon when myra and i were sitting together in our favorite nook in the show-room i have a fancy myra i said that something is going to happen my lion has been so queer to-day i see a look in his face as if he knew something for we had each chosen one lion as more particularly our own i think they always look rather like that said myra dreamily but i suppose something must happen soon i shall be going home next week next week i repeated oh myra i could not speak for a moment then i remembered how i had made up my mind to be brave 
do you mind going home i asked i mean are you sorry to go i'm always sorry to leave grandpapa and grandmamma she said and the lions and this funny old house but i'm very happy at home and i shall like it still better with miss finmore no i wouldn't be unhappy i'd be very glad to think of seeing father and mother and my little brothers again i wouldn't be unhappy except for you know geraldine for leaving you and my little friend's voice shook dear myra i said but you mustn't mind about me i'm going to try but here i had to stop to choke down something in my throat after all i went on after a moment or two more than a quarter of the time that father and mamma have to be away is gone and perhaps in the summer holidays i shall see hattie i wish myra was beginning but a voice interrupted her it was miss finmore's i have brought you down a letter that has just come by the second post geraldine dear she said a letter from south america oh thank you i said eagerly seizing it miss finmore strode to the other side of the room and myra followed her to leave me alone to read my letter it was a pretty long one but i read it quickly so quickly that when i had finished it i felt breathless and then i turned the pages over and glanced at it again i felt as if i could not believe what i read it was too good too beautifully good to be true myra i gasped and myra ran back to me looking quite startled i think i must have grown very pale no no i went on it's nothing wrong read it or ask miss finmore she reads writing quicker oh myra isn't it beautiful they stood and read it and then we all three kissed and hugged each other and myra began dancing about as if she had gone out of her mind geraldine geraldine i can't believe it she kept saying and miss finmore's pretty eyes were full of tears i wonder if any of my readers can guess what this delightful news was it was not that mamma was coming home no that could not be yet but the next best to that it certainly was it was to tell me this that until dear father and she returned my home was to be with myra and i was to be miss finmore's pupil too wherever myra was there i was to be principally at her father's vicarage in the country but some part of the year with her kind grandparents at great mexington it was all settled and arranged of course i did not trouble my head about the money part of it though afterwards mamma told me that both mr and mrs raby and the cranstons had been most exceedingly kind making out that the advantage of a companion for their little girl would be so great that all the thanking should be on their side though of course they respected father too much not to let him pay a proper share of all the expense and it really cost less than my life at green bank though father was now a good deal richer and would not have minded paying a good deal more to ensure my happiness there is never so much story to tell when people are happy and things go rightly and the next year or two of my life except of course for the separation from my dear parents were very happy even though father's appointment in south america kept him and mamma out there for nearly three years instead of two i was able to bear the disappointment in a very different way with such kind and sympathizing friends at hand to cheer me so that there is nothing bitter or sad to look back to in that part of my childhood hattie spent the summer holidays with me either at crowley vicarage or sometimes at the seaside where miss finmore took care of us three once or twice he and i paid a visit to mrs selwood which we enjoyed pretty well as we were together though otherwise it was rather dull and oh how happy it was when father and mamma at last came home no words could describe it it was not quite unmixed pleasure nothing ever is the wise folks say for there was the separation from myra and her family but after all that turned out less than we feared miss finmore married soon after and as father had now a good post in london and we lived there it was settled that myra should be with us and join in my lessons for a good part of the year while i very often went back to crowley with her for the summer holidays and never without staying a few days at great mexington to see mr and mrs cranston and the lions many years have passed since i went there for the last time myra's grandparents have long been dead my own dear mother and father are dead too for i am growing quite old my grandchildren are older now than i was when i ran away from school at green bank but once while mamma was still alive and well she and i together strolled through the streets of the grim town which had for a time been our home and lived over the old days again in fancy i remember how tightly i clasped her hands when we passed the corner where once was the old quigoris's shop all changed now and walked down the street still not very different from what it had been 
where we used to live. There is no use in going to Mr. Cranston's showrooms. They have long been done away with, but the lions are still to be seen. They stand in the hall of Myra's pretty house in the country, where she and Haddon, her husband, have lived for many years, ever since my brother left the army, and they came home for good from India. I spend a part of every year with them, for I am alone now. They want me to live with them altogether, but I cling to a little home of my own. Our grandchildren know the lions well, and stroke their smooth sides, and gaze up into their dark faces, just as Myra and I used to do. So I promised them that sometime I would write out the simple story that I have now brought to a close. The End End of Section 12 Good News End of the Carved Lions by Mrs. Molesworth